All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome to another Auto Trading Live Strategy Session with Jeff Tompkins. This is Richard Van Rich here with Craig Ward in the chat. We're really excited to have you guys with us here today. Hope you guys are all having a great week so far. Got a lot of great information to go over tonight. And if this is your first time on the show, you'll notice that your microphone is muted. That's so that we can hear Jeff talk. And if you have any questions, though, tonight, don't worry. There's a Q&A box. Uh, we recommend you put those questions in there so that we can all see them. And uh, let's see, if you have to hop off for any reason, don't worry, this is being recorded and be available in the members area and on YouTube uh, later tonight. And so if you haven't already, you want to definitely subscribe to YouTube. We're posting new videos up there all the time. So before I bring on Jeff, let me just read the disclaimer. Trading securities and options involves risk. Part of buying and selling an option, investor receive a copy of the characteristics and risk of standardized options. Investors need a broker to trade securities and options must be suitability requirements. Past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance, and performance figures are based on actual trades, including real money results. Due to crit time critical nature of trading, broker fees, and activity of other subscribers, there's no guarantee the subscribers will mirror our performance. And performance numbers shown are based on trades users could enter based on the trade signals. All right, with that being said, let me get over to Jeff. Jeff, you there? Hey there. Hey, 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 hey everybody. Happy Tuesday. That's my dad. That's my dad joke. My dad joke. <laughs> two twenty two twenty two. <laughs> Tell everybody about the flight you're flying out on tomorrow. Oh yeah. So uh, we're as you guys may know, we're going to be down at the uh, Las Vegas Traders Expo uh, this week, and I uh, checked into my flight, and believe it or not, the flight number is triple seven 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 seven. So I'm going yeah. straight there and putting putting down a bunch of money on uh, black. There you go. Way to do it. Should, maybe we should take a poll and see. Black or red. Right. <laughs> That's a good idea. So, guys, if you do come to Las Vegas, we will be at the Traders Expo. We have a booth in the lobby, and we'll have another booth probably at a cabana by a wet bar. Probably. At the what? The cabana? <laughs> the cabana with a wet bar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'd It'll rather. Be back at booth. Yeah. Uh, I lost my Q&A. There it goes. All right. Um, Hey, Joseph, excited to have you here. Happy Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Yeah, that's, I guess we'll never have a 2 on a Tuesday, so. I know. We should be in Vegas now. Yeah, yeah, they should have scheduled it a day earlier, I guess, or two days earlier, so. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, um, so tonight we're going to start out with our market overview, map out our levels, um, and, and right now there's some really, important uh, key levels that we're gonna be looking at. And so for that reason, we're making the focus of tonight uh, support and resistance. Um, and how do I use those to identify buying and selling pressure uh, even ahead of uh, market move? So um, if, we, if we map these out diligently and monitor them, um, they can, and, and we actually saw that today, uh, at least on the NASDAQ. The, the NASDAQ, you know, of course, tends to trade uh, a little bit more uh, volatility than vol with more volatility than um, the, the S and P and the Russell and the Dow. Um, so we, we've seen a we've seen the double bottom on the Nasdaq, but not on the other major indices. So um, we're gonna uh, look at that. I'm just kind of looking at my at the futures right now. Um, but uh, certainly on the Nasdaq, it uh, has has allowed us to see where that bounce uh, was likely to occur, and we saw it intraday today, but. Uh, it's important to keep keep an eye on it because there's a lot of uh, you know geopolitical tension with uh, Russia and Ukraine and things that are um, serving as a catalyst for uh, market movement right now. Um, generally, when we see these types of geopolitical catalysts, they're not uh, in and of themselves what are what are causing uh, any longer medium or longer term market moves. But there, when the market's uh, shifting from secular bull to secular bear, and we have something like this, it's uh, enough of a catalyst to, um, to, to cause increased volatility and um, you know, these types of uh, more sustained moves or trends in the market. So uh, we're going to focus on that um, and then uh, spend a little bit more time today on this session uh, working with you guys with what you want to look at. So. Uh, get ready to share your favorite symbol, whatever you guys want to look at um, on the charts. And then we'll uh, wrap up with Q&A. So uh, let's check real quick and see if we've got uh, a data update on Zillion. 
Uh, and by the way, we're, we're launching a zillion down at the expo this week. So we're excited for that. Um, yeah, still waiting on that. So we'll just, uh, for the sake of time, we'll start out. Uh, usually it usually comes in seven Eastern, but we'll go ahead and start out with um, on the broker platform on TOS. Uh, so I'm going to stop my video share so you guys can see the full screen. <clears throat> Looks good. All right, let me just drag this over. I've got too many monitors going on. All right, so uh, let's start with the S&P. How wide is that mon the new one you got? What's that? How wide is that new curve one you got? Oh, my ultra wide. Yeah, I, I got. If you guys, if you guys don't know, I, I'm really interested in aviation, um, and I, I'm actually in the process of getting my pilot's license. And uh, I'm a I'm a huge like uh, Microsoft flight simulator fan, so I've got a full like flight simulator set up in my office, and um, I bought this this ultra wide monitor to kind of make it more um so you know immersive and and all and uh it's incredible it's like i think it's like 49 inches gosh it's kind of like, like the pictures you sent are crazy yeah it's basically like a like 237 inch uh monitor side by side but yeah it's pretty pretty cool but then but i don't i don't present off of that because i've got all my other um charting and stuff up there with my for my uh, broker account. So I, I've got two other monitors that I, that I do a lot of my presentation stuff off of. So, um, all right. So looking at the S and P, um, so, uh, volatile day again today, you know, we've had, uh, a little bit of a rebound here, uh, with, uh, you know, didn't, didn't take us very far right up in the resistance. We actually mapped this level out at, on our last session, uh, last Tuesday. Um, let me get my drawing tool. So uh, the 4,500 level we, we talked about last week, and uh, you can see that sure enough, uh, there was rejection off of that level. So we got a little bit of a rebound as the VIX was uh, retreating from its, its latest spike. Um, and there was the, the retest of that level. And then um, we got the sell off from there. Um, so what we're looking looking at right now is the uh, 4200 level for a retest of that double for a double bottom pattern, basically a retest of that from the uh, sell up back in January. So um, that's our major support to watch right now on the S and P. Uh, if we see, and I suspect we probably will. Uh, we've actually got a little bit of a slingshot uh, setting up here as well on, on the S and P. So uh, you can see that we've. Uh, hit the lower band there. Um, tomorrow, let's see, we're, what are we, Tuesday? So uh, we've got a few more trading days, but uh, of course, uh, market holiday yesterday for President's Day, so a short trading week. Um, but we've got three more days still to uh, see if this sets up as a, as a slingshot as price trails down. So I suspect that it, it will. Um, I think we'll, and we've seen it on the NASDAQ because when we toggle over to the NASDAQ, and take a look at that. Uh, we'll, you'll see that that's already occurred, but I think that uh, we'll see it on the S&P and, and probably the Dow as well. So uh, retest of this 4,200 level, um, and that's our support to watch. Um, so these can be good buying opportunities, but also remember that uh, last week we spent a lot of time talking about the shift from secular bull to secular bear. Um, I, I, I would be very surprised if we get back up into the 4,800 level on the S&P. Um, the market structure has, has really changed. Um, we've been in this you know, decade plus long uh, secular bull market uh, and all, all evidence points to that being over. Um, there's not really a whole lot left to sustain these higher price levels that we saw um, later in the year last year. So, <clears throat> um, so watch this, uh, 4,200 level for support. And, uh, that could create a buy-in opportunity, but I, I definitely in the context of this, uh, really significant market shift, 
um, want to see uh, at least some pretty um, good confirmation that uh, that level is going to hold for a rebound. Um, and the, if it does rebound off that level, I won't, wouldn't expect it to rebound a whole lot. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not an opportunity where I would jump in to the long side very aggressively, um, but maybe, maybe good for a short, uh, short, um, or I shouldn't say short, I should say uh, um, short term rebound, um, maybe back up into what would not then be resistance uh, around 4,300. So maybe, maybe good for about a hundred points to the upside if, if this level holds. Uh, if it breaks, then that this support level will become resistance. And, uh, you know, we're looking at, um, depending on, you know, it, we don't know how far it would break below but and sell off, but um, some sort of a rebound back up into 4,200. And then, and then I'd be looking for uh, bearish opportunities um, below 4,200 on the S&P. Um, so uh, that's really, you know, right now, what we want to be looking out for is this major support level at 4,200. Um, with resistance at 4,300, both century marks. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at the, um, let me clear these out, um, at, the, at the NASDAQ. Um, any questions there, Richard, on the S&P? Um, someone is kind of folded in. They're saying, um, you're saying, talking about, it seems like things are kind of looking to be going down. They're saying that in Zillion, it's looking like the three long-term trends are showing bullish. Do you see that? The three long-term trends? Yes, what he's saying here. It's anonymous. Um, we'll have to we'll have to go. We'll get over to the Zillion platform here momentarily and look. But um, yeah, it sh it shouldn't. Okay. Before you go back, uh, Chris just asked for the slingshot. Does a candle need to pierce the lower band or should it just close below? Oh, good question. Um. Yeah, it doesn't have to, uh, you know, the low of the candle should uh, touch the lower band. But today, like on the NASDAQ, was the first day that it did. So it's still not a, a confirmed slingshot. Um, I, I want to see price like up here where there was a, a confirmed slingshot. Um, I want to see it actually start to trail the lower band. So I usually wait, you know, three, four, five days to see if that happens, just depending on on the volatility and the the magnitude of the um, of the sell-off. So uh, sometimes it can happen very quickly. Sometimes you know it takes a little bit longer, but uh, this would be the first day that um, you know telling us it could potentially be a slingshot. But you know tomorrow, like like right now, I mean the, the I'm looking at the uh, E-mini S and P futures. They're up about half a percent. So if Price does, you know, tomorrow and through the rest of the week doesn't continue to follow this lower band, then it, then it wouldn't be a slingshot. Um, so we really need to see see it trail that over a few days minimum. Um, and always with the slingshot, we want to be looking for support. So the thing with this setup, if it is, you know, a slingshot, is um, we have a major uh, support level here from the lows back on uh, uh, January twenty fourth. So, um, which is good, you know, we want, we want to see price trade below this level for it to be a slingshot. So that's just kind of more of a, more confluence that uh, tells us that we're in a slingshot setup. If price does trail the lower volatility band and trade, you know, trade below this major low, uh, from late January. Okay. okay so, um. Let's take a look here at our levels. Um, so we'll mark it at 13,800. It's, it's our century mark. It's uh, close to the low from the, the 24th. Uh, the actual low was 13,724.85. Um, we didn't quite get down there today. The low from today on the NASDAQ was uh, 13. 72092. Uh, so pretty close. 
So if this holds, this could be, you know, a, a rebound back up into uh, the 14,500 level, which is the, uh, the average. Um, often what we see with these double bottoms is uh, like kind of a W pattern. So, uh, you know, we'll get this, there's a slingshot from the past. Um, we get the initial rebound, uh, the sell off to the double bottom, and then uh, move back up to that, um, the middle of the W. So that would be the 15,000 level. And that's significant. It's a millennial mark. And um, we could definitely see uh, a retest of that as resistance, right? Um, not, you know, it, it's strong. It's not, um, there hasn't been major sell-offs from that level, so it's not real strong, but we can see a lot of tests of that level. Um, and so a little bit of struggle to break through it. We got a lot of consolidation around that level back in uh, July last year. Um, and then of course it served as strong resistance here in late January, early February. Um, so it's significant. I, I don't want to, you know, downplay it. It's, it's definitely um, one to watch if we can get back up there. Um, if we break 15,000, then, uh, or, it, you know, I would actually say uh, to watch, get that drawn a little bit better, to watch this level right here around 15,200 because that was a low from uh, January 10th, the high from uh, February 2nd. Um, so if we break through that, then you know, we're looking at uh, more moment, potential momentum to the upside. Um, but I suspect you know, these are gonna be very strong resistance areas that are difficult to break through, um, especially considering you know, this, you know, the market structure really changing on us. So uh, let's see, let's draw this out. Um, so the VIX is, or sorry, the, the NASDAQ has sold off, um, down in this double bottom pattern. Um, and we're just kind of waiting to see, you know, if the S and P, the Dow and the Russell follow that, um, and see the Russell's got a way to go. Uh, actually it's the ETF. Let's actually look at the, um, in the 1900. Uh, so also very, very important to watch 1900 on the Russell for more of a um, yeah, barometer of, you know, are, is this bull market really coming to an end or has it ended? And are we likely to see you know, a negative year for the first time in a long time? Um, so 1900 on the uh, Russell. But you, can, you can see like on the Dow, the S&P, we're just not quite down to this double bottom. bottom. Um, geez, drawing is not the best today, but uh, 330 on the DJ, DJX. So if that breaks, Look, look for that. Right now, that's support. If it breaks, look for that as a resistance area um, for short opportunities on a, on a retest back up into that level. So if we break, look for price to come back up, retest, and then potentially um, move back down off that. So how do you like feel overall about the way the market's been moving the past week? Are you kind of, you feel like it's kind of in line with your projection is with the, the velocity of the movement, or do you feel like it's kind of gearing up to really drop or what's your kind of feelings on what it's been doing so far? I just think it's very vulnerable, very uh, fragile right now. Um, as I mentioned last week, there, there's just not a lot to keep, you know, these to sustain these higher prices that we've seen. Um, I think the, the market was way overvalued and that's what we typically see. And if you guys weren't on last week or, um, haven't watched the replay. That's I, I, I would suggest doing that because that's I talked a lot about like that's that's how these shifts from secular bull to secular bear markets work. Is we typically see, you know, we get clues about the end of the bull market. You know, potentially you know a year or two, even three years before 
back to the end. So my opinion is that the bull market was over quite some time ago, back in 2019, 2020. Um, and because this, these things don't happen overnight, uh, we're, we're seeing that kind of start to play out and um, present itself more significantly than some of these other selves that we've seen, which have been significant as well, but you know, we've still been able to rebound off them. I, I'm not so confident now that we're going to rebound um, back up to new highs at this point. Yeah, I noticed like they they raised the the uh, the amount of money you have to plug in in order to trade futures, and it's like I don't know if that's like a telltale sign. They feel like it's going to be pretty volatile, so they start hiking up. Oh, margin, yeah, margin yeah. requirements, yeah, yeah. That's that's another that's another warning sign, another clue. Um, you know, basically the the brokers are aware that um, volatility is increasing, market conditions are changing. So um, when you see them uh, uh, raise margin requirements for leveraged products like futures and things, then um, that's you know telling us that uh, the market's pretty fragile. Um, but today we did see, um, uh, and this is why I think that we will probably have some degree of a bounce off of that, those support levels that we just looked at on the indices. Um, we did see a, uh, a decrease in the, uh, I mean, it closed higher, right? So if you look at the close from yesterday, we closed higher, but um, we spiked way up overnight. So um, due to the futures uh, sell off. So the, the volatility still spiked, but um, we did get a retreat today in the VIX. Uh, so the, the support level there to watch is, um, well, the resistance first, let's look at that is uh, 32. And that's a common resistance level on the VIX. You can see that back here in um, uh, March to see how we spiked up to that level and, and retreated. And um, we also did that uh, just recently, earlier in February. Um, we saw that that level hold uh, back in late November. Uh, we got a bigger spike, and this is kind of a head and shoulders pattern actually, um, but we got a bigger spike here uh, in January. Um, so I think we could see the, the VIX retreat from 32, to lower levels, um, and if we see that happen as the indices are are uh, approaching this double bottom bottom from the lows um, back in January, then that that's my my clue that you know we'll see some degree of a of a near term bounce from that double bottom and um, some some degree of move up. I, but again, I don't expect it to be very significant um, and. Uh, Eventually, the, the volatility is going to die down. Probably, you know, once we have more of a, you know, we have a clearer picture of what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, um, that's what's going to to cause the vol. That's what's going to cause the volatility to subside. But markets can still move down, you know, over the longer term with lower volatility. We're just not going to see these big, uh, you know, dramatic price swings intraday that we see that we've seen recently, like today. Um, so that's why, again, it's, I, I emphasize this in almost every one of our Tuesday sessions, you know, watch, watch the VIX in, in context with the indices. Um, cause that, that can help us, you know, navigate that and time it and understand what's going on with volatility. All right. So any questions there? No, we're good on that. Cool. All right. So, um, uh, so it, in terms of support and resistance, um, that's why you know, and this is some, that's why we start every se Tuesday session with this exercise of mapping out levels. This is really my first step in my trading process to uh, you know, kind of a top-down approach of identifying what's happening in, in the broader indices before I make any trading decisions. Um, with individual securities or futures or whatever I'm trading, um, I really want to know first what's happening in, in the broader market. Where are my levels? Uh, where is there going to potentially be buying pressure or selling pressure? 
um, you know, right now we had a lot of, um, on the S&P, we had a lot of selling pressure off 4,600. Um, and that's a, a level that we've mapped out previously. Um, um, in the past, we've had a lot, lot of buying pressure off between the 4,200 and 4,300 zone. So you can see that um, from back in September, July, more recently in January, still to be determined here for February. Um, but that's historically where there's been, um, there's been some demand from bigger market, market participants to drive up prices off that level. So that's a demand point. That's a, there's buying pressure off that level. Anytime a demand uh, level um, isn't obeyed, you know, it's, it's broken and price uh, moves significantly below that, um, then it becomes a supply level or, or uh, yeah, a supply level. So basically that um, there's oversupply, price moves down, it retests, and then it becomes resistance. So that's why it's so important to watch these horizontal uh, support and resistance levels. Um, and when used in conjunction with uh, volatility bands like the Bollinger Bands, which is what we use to gauge volatility and um, moves from, you know, standard deviation moves from the mean, our center band, um, when we find confluence between those, and you'll, you'll, very frequently find those um, as you run these exercises. Uh, as, like right now, you'll see that um, the lower band and uh, the close from today was very close to a horizontal support level, 4,300 on the S&P, and uh, a two standard, standard deviation move from the mean. So um, that's... Uh, what lends more confluence to these types of um, su support and resistance uh, areas. So the, and, and I refer to the, the horizontal levels like this yellow line at 4,300 that we just mapped um, as, you know, a static level. So it, you know, it doesn't move. There's been buying pressure from that level in the past. Um, the volatility bands, are a dynamic support and resistance. So the lower band is dynamic support and the upper band is dynamic resistance. And you'll often find, as I, as I mentioned, those coincide with our horizontal support and resistance. And we wanna look for that. So we wanna look for a static support and resistance level, uh, in this case, a support level that is near the dynamic support level, the lower Bollinger Band. And we want to look for um, resistance to coincide with uh, the upper band, the dynamic resistance band to coincide with a static uh, horizontal resistance area. Right now in the S&P, that's 4,600. Um, but here's something um, that I want to point out as well that is a clue of um, volatility expansion and a potential slingshot setup. So see what, and this really just started to happen over the last day or two. See how this upper band is starting to point up. So it was, you know, we had a lot of volatility expansion here in January because there was a big sell-off. And you can see the upper band um, peaking around 4,900 and then moving down. But see, now what's happening is that upper resistance band is starting to uh, you know, form a base at 4,600 and then move away. So see how it's starting to point up there? At the same time that the lower band is starting to point down. So whenever you see our vol the volatility bands diverge and point away from each other, when they were previously pointing toward each towards each other, um, that's also a signal of um, potential future volatility. And when it happens at the lower band, um, that would be for a sell-off. And if it happens at the upper band, um, we typically would see uh, a move up in, the, in, in prices. But uh, right now we're at the lower band and we're seeing the, the bands diverge and point away from each other after 
a little bit of a um, get this, um, convergence. So you see how they were starting to uh, point towards each other, and then they start to move away again. Um, and that's often what's per what precipitates a slingshot setup when we start to see the bands go from pointing towards each other to away. Um, and that, that gives us really valuable information that um, volatility is increasing um, and uh, price could potentially continue to move lower. Um, but we want to still keep an eye on lower support because um, that could certainly occur, but it's got to stop at some point. It's got to eventually, you know, uh, there's just like any other market in the world uh, that's uh, driven by supply and demand. Um, once there's, uh, right now, there's just not a lot of demand in the market. So once that gets overstretched, uh, buyers will come in and there will be supply. Um, and what, what, you know, creates supply are lower prices, you know, big market participants don't want to buy at high prices. They want to buy at low prices, just like you would do if you were buying a house or a car or anything. You want to buy when prices are low, not when they're high. So the market works the same way. And that's, that's what basically, you know, happens after these sell-offs is um, we're looking for uh, that oversupply to exhaust itself and then turn into demand. Um, and as retail traders, we're really, looking for clues from bigger market participants that are dictating that. So once we see them react um, at a level that they've reacted at in, in the past, because like when we look at these other demand points where there was buying pressure, uh, they're the ones that, that really created that and drove prices back up. So if they did that in the past, there was a reason for that. Um, so we wanna look to see if they're gonna do that again uh, in, in, you know, at this current, you know, situation in the market. So, um, that's what we're, what we really want to watch for with these supply and demand points or horizontal, uh, support and resistance. Cool. So, um, hopefully that gives you kind of a clear picture of what's happening right now. Um, with supply and demand, support and resistance, volatility. Um, so we'll pause there, see if any questions have come through, if you guys need any uh, more clarification on the indices and the VIX. Um, and if not, we can uh, spend some time looking at uh, some tickers. Yeah, Bob had a good question uh, regarding the VIX. He was saying, being that we're looking at the VIX when we're looking at SPX, is it also useful to compare the VIX with say the diamonds, IWM or the Qs? Um, to the extent that, you know, markets are correlated, right? So uh, generally we see, you know, if we see a sell-off in, in an index, it, it affects all of them, not always. Um, and there are volatility indexes, indices that, uh, you know, for instance, that follow the NASDAQ. Um, but as far as the VIX goes, it's truly a volatility indicator for the S&P. Um, and it, it uses options. Um, it basically looks at the uh, option pricing uh, going out 30 days in expiration um, to, to give us a reading of what the expected or implied volatility is over the course of the next 30 days. Um, so while we can't directly correlate the VIX to let's say the NASDAQ or the IWM, um, because of the, the mark, overall market correlation between the major indices, we, it, it certainly is a, is a good barometer, but it's not um, directly correlated. Um, I, but I, I, yeah, I, you know, personally, I use the VIX um, as a tool to guide me, you know, th for all the indices, whether it's the NASDAQ or the IBM or the uh, RUT, the Russell or, um, or the Dow. So just because of the, you know, market correlation that exists there. Gotcha. Let's see if there's anything else really. No, that's all for now. All right. Um, I'm going to grab a, a, a refill my water here real quick. If you want to uh, gather some tickers and we can take a look at, um, I'm actually going to go over the zillion 
the dashboard and see if we can get our data update for today. Uh, yes, Stephen, we did uh, talk about the VIX already. This is recorded. So if you guys, anybody that came in late, um, you guys can check out the recording um, in the members area later tonight, or we'll have it up on YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow or the day after. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, you have any, uh, anything we want? Yeah, I got a handful here. Um, Calky put his in right off the bat. He went, he, he put in Microsoft, so we'll take a look at Microsoft first. Okay. So let me take a look. We're in aggressive mode, okay. Um, so Microsoft, is uh, in a bit of a similar pattern of the, the uh, major indices. Um, I think it has more room to run up to the downside. Um, this low uh, from back in late January, which coincides, I mean, the low was, was uh, surpassed the low from October of 2021, but um, that 280 level is going to be very strong in terms of support, but there's room to run. So close today, 287. So, you know, I think, uh, I mean, it, it could potentially reverse off of this level just because um, we see on January 25th, there is, uh, there is demand and buying pressure from, the, from there. Um, so uh, today's price range on Microsoft um, is a good uh, indicator of support and resistance. So 284 to 292, um, I'd be looking at. Uh, so unless we get some price consolidation uh, tomorrow or through the, the rest of the week, um, in other words, like we don't break the low from today or the high. Uh, you know, and that could very well happen. Um, but if we break the low from today, then we're looking at support around 280. Uh, if the high breaks at 292, because um, that was a little bit of brief support here uh, from last week, uh, then uh, we may see prices rebound a bit, but we still got um, a bit of a range here to get to uh, our major support, which I would map it around, around 280. Um, the true double bottom would be uh, the low from January at 270, around 276. There's a lot of volatility at that level. So that's another thing to look at. Actually, this is a good example. Um, uh, when when price uh, forms a support level or a resistance, either way, but in this case, support on this candle, um, look at look at what it does at that level. So um, the reason you know this uh, Microsoft this stock uh, traded down to a low of around two seventy six and then rebounded up into you know about the three fifteen level. Um, because there, you, know, you can tell there was a lot of battling between buyers and sellers or bulls and bears on Microsoft on this particular day. It's a very wide range candle um, that cl closed uh, with bullish sentiment. Uh, so that's you know important. I want to look at that and take it into consideration. Um, the question is, you know, uh, over the next the near term in the next week or so, let's say, uh, is it going to you know, do that again? Right now we're seeing some volatility contraction. And I say that because the, the range of the, of the daily price action or the high and low of the candle um, is decreasing. So see, we had these, um, we've had 
anytime you see like a really wide range candle, there's a, a lot of volatility and volume behind that typically. Um, but then when you start to see it consolidate and you see price uh, ranges decrease or the high and low are closer together than they were previously, um, that means that, you know, the, the battle is kind of coming to an end, you know, so to speak. It's, it's, there's indecision potentially. Um, there are people waiting on the sidelines to see what, what's happening at those levels. Um, so that's also another clue is, is the price range for the day. We're seeing that decreasing. And often you'll see, you know, price range decrease uh, around a previous support or resistance level. So since we're kind of approaching some of these uh, past major support levels, um, and at the same time, volatility is decreasing, um, that's also a good timing component to use to look at, you know, is the, is the sell-off that's been taking place over the past couple of weeks starting to dry up? Is it slowing down? And are we going to get confirmation of some sort of a, a bounce from one of these levels? So I think probably in Microsoft, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the down move is, is over, but I always wait for confirmation for, uh, you know, to tell me like on this particular day, that would have been it. Cause you see a rejection of this low from back in late September, tons of buying pressure off that level. Look how far the stock went up from that 280 level up into the you know, 350 level. So for one reason or another, and you know, we don't need to be, we don't need to know all the fundamentals of Microsoft or what's going on with, with the company. We just need to know that, you know, there was buying pressure at that, at that level. So for one reason or another, um, buyers were coming in and buying down around 280. So uh, if we see that happen again, then that, that could potentially be our uh, indicator that this sell-off is losing steam and we'll see some degree of a rebound. Uh, and that's where the importance of, you know, mapping out the resistance comes into play because we want to see if that rebound occurs, how far can the, this thing go? Um, if we're, you know, going to play it to the long side. So um, that's a good one to look at, but yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Phil was asking, do you see like a, a slingshot in this sense, since it's um, the Bollinger Bands. Um, yeah, let's plop those on there and see. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so there there is a slingshot um, here going on here. See how as we looked at on, on the index, that we have diverging outer bands, and then we have price trailing the lower band. So definitely a slingshot, but it, right now it just hasn't moved very much. Um, the first touch was yesterday of the lower band, um, not yesterday, uh, last Friday. Um, so uh, th that was the first touch. Um, we trailed, but um, gap down at the open, and then trade it up from that gap. So basically kind of filled that gap. Uh, bulls tried to push price up into the 290 level, but bears came back in, drove it down and closed it uh, pretty close to where it closed uh, last Friday. And um, with the slingshot, we, all, we look for uh, price to trail that band. We wanna see it do it to you know really get the best opportunities in the slingshot is to wait for price to, trail that into a support level. Um, and so we just did that. We just looked at support. It hasn't trailed it into a, a support level quite yet. There's a bit of one here at 284, um, as, I, as I just mentioned. But um, for me, you know, I, I, I would look for um, a slingshot to trail into more like the 280 level. And if it were to do that, um, so if this if price trailed down to the 280 level, then I've got a better opportunity um, to to play that slingshot because uh, I've got from 280 to 
about 288 or about eight points for uh, the move back up to that where that volatility expansion or in other words where the the band started to and it's probably truly more like the 292 level um, where that volatility expansion uh, began so um, that would be you know where price touched the lower band but also where um, the upper and lower volatility bands started to diverge um, so that right here in mid-february is where they really started to that that convergence where they were moving together towards each other started to slow down and stop and then um, turn around and start to diverge. So um, yeah, Microsoft could be a, a decent opportunity with the right confirmation, um, with the right patience, getting down into a real a stronger support level. Um, and 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 one of the one of these sessions soon we we really should talk a lot about more about um you know uh, money management and um you know scaling into to trades because uh what i do a lot of times even if i identify one of these levels um or you know i'm looking at a slingshot setup uh i i typically don't go all in off that level um i often will scale in um starting my position at that level and then if you know if i'm wrong on my timing and you know the slingshot continues, um, which is fine. Then I'll look to my next support level. And um, let me zoom out here. And I could scale, and I could I continue to add the position at lower uh, price levels. Um, there's really not a lot of support until kind of around. Uh, so we got 275, and then 265. Uh, back here from back here in April. Um, but, you know, if I'm wrong on my timing, then that's okay. Uh, as long as I'm using, you know, staying within my risk parameters and using the right money management, um, I can go ahead and add to the position at a lower price called dollar, dollar cost averaging. And even though I might've been wrong buying up around 275 to 280, if I buy the other half of my position um, around 265, uh, then I've, really lowered my cost basis to, you know, 270 to 275, depending on where I got in. So, you know, that's a, a, a really classic uh, trade adjustment, you know, is using uh, a scaling in method. Uh, and the important thing is you just don't, you never want to scale into something um, and increase your risk to the trade beyond what you, when you plan the trade to begin with, you would have allocated. So, um, as long as you're staying with risk your risk parameters, that's a really effective way when you're not right the very first time um, to, to average into the position, lower your cost basis. And uh, when a rebound occurs, you know, then, hey, you weren't, you weren't right the very first time, but you were able to make an adjustment to it and um, make it work out in your favor potentially. So. Awesome, awesome. Um, Stephen wants to see uh, NWL. NWL? New, yeah. new brands? All right. Not familiar with this name. I always like looking at stuff I'm not familiar with because that's how I become familiar with it. All right. So, uh, so yeah. So, on, on Newell, we've got volatility expansion to the upside. Um, a pretty big move down to almost 3%, 2.9% today. Um, but uh, reaching a support level. Um, so I see strong support around 2450 to yeah, 2450 to 27 uh, to uh, 2475. It's kind of our support zone. I'm looking here. Yeah. Um, so often on these volatility expansions, um, you know, the upside, you'll see, you'll see this. And there was a, you know, strong break above that resistance zone um, back in mid-February. We'll see that happen often and then uh, come back down and retest. 
Um, that retest for me, I mean, I guess if you look at the highs here, so if we draw a, a support level from or near the low from today, um, there was strong resistance there back in early to mid November. Uh, still a little bit early for me because um, you can see that we have also got um, price in that zone from earlier and some rejection off of that 2450. So it's so, you know, a lot of these aren't exact. They're more of a zone. Um, this one uh, really is between 2450 and 2475. Um, so uh, yeah, I would you know, watch those levels closely on Newell and, and wait to see uh, if this level holds or if it breaks and goes down to 2450, if that level holds, might be a, potentially be a buying opportunity um, for this uptrend. Um, you know, the, the, uh, average price, the center band, um, is quite a bit lower, but it's dynamic. So it's always moving every day. Um, and this is kind of the tra trajectory of the, that. Uh, so, it, you know, that could also be a dynamic support level right now. That's around 2375. Uh, if either, if this zone breaks, if 2450 breaks, um, so I think, you know, medium, term uh, uh well near term i think you know there's obviously selling pressure um but in the context of a breakout from strong resistance and a volatility expansion um so uh there's some potential buying opportunities in my opinion with newell if we see price uh come back down and hold one of these support levels and um 2350 and then if we see any of those break uh, and not hold, then uh, this bullish move to the upside to me is probably lost its steam um, and uh, could move back, back down into uh, support. Uh, we have very strong support around 21. So that was really a range, you know, that the stock was in 21 and 23.50. Um, and then if we look at the peak here at 26.50, um, that's going to be a resistance zone for us. So if we do get a bounce, uh, you know, I, I look for, you know, retests of resistance as initial profit targets. Uh, and then, you know, if there's a lot of, you know, bullish buying behind the stock uh, past those levels, I wait for, you know, that to kind of play out kind of like it did here and then, and then wait for the retest um, for, added confirmation that, you know, this isn't a false breakout or anything of that nature. So, but yeah, overall, um, I don't know really, like I said, don't know much about uh, this name. I'm not familiar with the company, uh, but just purely on a, a technical basis, price action analysis, that's kind of how I see this going. Um, it was in this range for a long time. Also something I take into consideration. Um, so you can see, well-defined range going back to September of last year. Um, so you, a lot of times when you're in these uh, well-defined range, sideways ranges for a long time and then you get a breakout, something significant is happening there. There's a reason there's buying pressure past that resistance level. And it's something to take note of. I, I think that um, once, typically once we get out of these longer term ranges that have been in place for months, uh, it, they tip, tend to hold. Um, so this looks pretty bullish. It's a good one to look at. All right. Um, Jeremiah asked for a Tesla. Yep. So, uh, Yeah, uh, you know, looking like pretty strong support around 800 on Tesla. Um, so we'll want to watch to see if that 800 level holds. And that, you know, of course, is a century mark. Um, these major price levels 
um, at century marks or millennial marks, like a thousand, um, are important to keep an eye on. You can see there's a lot of support around the millennial mark on Tesla. Came resistance there back in uh, January. Uh, stock's been kind of sideways ranging over the past um, month. So not a whole lot of um, you know, defined movement. There's a lot of indecision, I think, right now in Tesla, uh, which could be an indication it's, it's basing and this 800 level might hold. Um, so if this 800 level holds, uh, I, you know, that's where I might look for buy opportunities. Um, and we could look for buy signals from trade trend um, near that 800 level with a potential move back up into, into 1000. Um, the other thing to keep an eye on though, that I'm looking at right now is this um, 880 to 900 level. You can see that there was a lot of support and buying pressure uh, there from mid-December last year because um, after this sell-off, buyers came in and drove price back up, not quite to all the previous highs, but close, um, and then back down. But that's going to serve as pretty strong resistance if we get a bounce off 800. Um, you know, that might be an initial target. Uh, initial target, to a profit target level up in around 880 to 900. Um, may see resistance there and see sellers come back in uh, at that level. So uh, like I talked about scaling into positions, um, a lot of times I'll scale out as well. Um, you know, uh, one of the, one of my favorite techniques is to uh, take half the position off at a resistance level. If I'm long, if I, you know, go in and buy, um, take out the position off at a major resistance, move my stop lo loss level up to my entry price. So it's basically break even um, on that, on the remaining half of the position. And then it gives, uh, you know, and in, in that fashion, it's kind of, I mean, it's, I hate to call it a risk-free trade because there's always a chance, you know, the stock, something could, catastrophic could happen, the stock could gap way down or something below your stop level. But um, keeping in mind, you did take a profit on the first half of the position. So that um, raises your, your cost basis or lowers your cost basis, raises your profit um, margin. And then keep that other half on. And if it does break that resistance, um, great. You've given yourself the chance to make more profit on the trade but if it does, if it doesn't happen and it, that resistance level holds and price goes back down to your entry point, well, then you had a break even on the second half of the trade, but you made money in the first half. So um, that's a nice, nice little money management technique to use in these situations in you know, combination with support and resistance. All right. Uh, Monica wants to look at a uh, Verizon BZ. All right. We're pushing up on eight o'clock too, so. Yeah, we'll take a look at Verizon and we can wrap up here. Let me. Yeah, so definitely uh, increased volatility in Verizon. You can see the wide range candles, a uh, lot, lot of price consolidation, basically in a sideways channel um, with uh, a little bit of upward bias. So see how the uh, upper volatility band starting to uh, diverge away from the lower, but the lower is very, very flat. Um, but that's support uh, down here around uh, 5150 50 to 50, uh, 5175. Um, we did get a buy signal yesterday from Trade Trend. Didn't uh, quite hit that entry price today on the trigger, but uh, could tomorrow potentially. Uh, if so, we do have a lot of resistance here at 5450. Um, not only is it the uh, upper uh, volatility band, two standard deviation move from the mean, um, we've got uh, some strong static horizontal resistance as well. As you can see, uh, there's been a lot of selling pressure at 54.50 that's pushed prices down. Um, haven't been able to break that. And we've traded below 54.50 um, going all the way back to uh, August, mid-August of last year. 
um, before um, that, that was broken. We see a lot of price consolidation around that level here um, from September of last year for, uh, and this was a nice, really nice slingshot. See this one, see how price trailed the lower band, came back up right to that level. So good bind. And we actually got a nice uh, trade trend buy warning right there. This price rebounded. This is a great, great trade actually, potential trade there. Um, so in these slingshots, yeah, I'm looking for, for, buy, for buy signals. Um, right now, you know, I, I tell people when you see price consolidating around an average, um, that's going to be your more, most difficult time to trade. So, um, you know, these are good opportunities where uh, we get the sell off al along the lower band volatility expansion and the slingshot setup. These are going to, you're going to get chopped up more. You're going to get more whipsaws. Um, more frustration um, when you get all this price consolidation um, near the average price. So um, this is kind of more of a ranging or channel trade, um, but not one I would, uh, and, and again, the buy signal did come in yesterday, but not one I would jump all over uh, for me because uh, we're, we don't have a lot of uh, room to run between current prices and resistance. There's just so much overhead resistance, um, 5390, 5450. I mean, you're looking at, you know, 60 cents. Um, I would be you know, more interested in waiting for this 5450 level to break, waiting for some volatility expansion of the upside and then a retest. And so I'd want to see price actually break 5450, then come back down. And that's where I would be interested in, you know, being a buyer of Verizon um, if that level can hold, because it was previously strong resistance. If it can break and hold, then it's strong support. And we've got a much, much higher probability of that level holding and more significant uh, price appreciation than this, you know, little 60 cent uh, move up into resistance. So I always try to avoid trading into resistance to the long side or into support to the short side. Um, if you just follow, if, you know, get one nugget out of tonight's session um, and, and obey that, it's, uh, it can keep you out of a lot of bad trades. A lot, a lot of people, you know, because most, most traders aren't going to take the time to do what we're doing together tonight. They're not going to take the time to map these things out and look at these major levels. So simply by doing that, you're giving yourself a huge edge. Um, and if you can avoid, once you've done that exercise, if you can avoid trading into those levels, you're going to find that, you know, you won't be in as many situations where you buy and price moves up a little bit and then reverses on you significantly and you lose everything that you, you know, the little amount you made to begin with, and then it turns into a big loss or, you know, if you're shorting, you know, don't, don't short into a support level. Um, and then uh, watch the stock turn around and, you know, take out your shorts and then boom, you're, you're in a, a losing trade. Um, so instead, you know, wait for these, watch these levels, map them, wait for them to see if the, you know, price obeys them, you know, like right here, um, if I had mapped this level out, a resistance area from the beginning of the year, and then saw this rejection here um, at the beginning of February, that could have been a nice opportunity to actually catch more of a price uh, move down into, you know, in this case, the mean, um, and, and it, using the money management technique I mentioned, you know, I might look at scaling out and taking profits on half the position at this level. And then if it does move to the lower range, I would take the other half. In this case, it didn't. So um, I probably would have had a break even on the second half of the position, but I made money on the first half. That's fine. And then, um, you know, I didn't get wiped out. So uh, yeah, I think if you avoid trading into uh, resistance uh, when you're taking a long position or into support on a short position, um, it can make a, a dramatic difference in your results and reduce frustration and increase your confidence, your consistency and all of those things. Um, so this is a good example to look at, but um, I'd rather see a buy signal like this one back here from October off of a slingshot than one near um, the middle volatility band, you know, the, the, mean, the mean or the average where we don't have a whole lot of room to run. Um, so patience is a virtue, right? We wanna wait and see if price actually breaks that resistance and comes back down and retests it and, and that level holds. Um, for somebody that 
you know, is patient enough to do that, they're going to uh, probably reap the rewards versus, um, you know, getting in when we're in a range here on Verizon and the, the roof or the ceiling of this range is pretty, pretty close. So great example to look at. Thanks for sharing that, Monica. That's a good one. She had a quick follow-up saying, what do you think the next level of resistance would be after that 5450 level? Oh, uh, let me pull it back up here. Uh, looks like, and, that, and that's the thing too, that, you know, I'd probably kind of try to stay away from this. Uh, 55, probably actually let me, 5550 looks a little stronger. Um, so 5550 looks pretty, pretty strong for resistance. So still, I mean, you're not, I mean, Verizon's not a real volatile stock. It doesn't make big price swings generally. So um, if it were to break 5450, come back down and retest, uh, we, we'd probably be looking at, you know, 5550 because I see a lot of support there, resistance there. So 5550 is very strong. Okay, great. So might be an opportunity, you know, if this, if 5450 breaks, comes back down and retests, uh, you know, you got a dollar um, to work with before you hit real strong resistance which is better than 60 cents, right? So. Exactly. All right. So uh, any additional uh, questions to wrap up? Um, let's see, I don't know if this is a quick answer or not, but Bob's asking thoughts on using bull puts on stocks that have a potential bullish or stagnant bias. Um. Uh, bull put credit spread. So, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, I think um, if you kind of work th work through the support levels that we've talked about tonight, um, find a very strong one, see the underlying stock or ETF or whatever you're looking at setting the bull put spread up on, um, seeing that level hold, uh, and then um, structuring your your bull put spread uh, with the short strike being below that level, um, those can be great opportunities for bull put credit spreads. Um, so for me, like during that process, I'm really looking for that very strong support level for price to bounce off of it, um, a trade a trade trend buy signal, um, and then setting my my short strike, the strike, you know, the, the strike that you're selling um, below that level. Um, and ideally, uh, you know, you could go all the way down to a 20 delta but if you find a very strong level, that, that can be an opportunity to potentially sell, sell a higher delta and take in more, more credit on the trade. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely. I, I like the bull put spread strategy um, with opportunities that have very strong support and uh, you know good premiums. There's a lot of other things to look at there. Uh, we want, uh, and that's the nice thing about bull put spreads. You, you know, you typically the rule of thumb is you want to sell premium when it's when it's higher and buy it when it's lower. Um, so generally on a sell-off, when you're hitting a support level and then bouncing off, um, while the sell-off is taking place, you're getting a spike in implied volatility. Um, so you get better premiums and more. you collect more credit. So um, it could be a great strategy, yeah, absolutely, for everything we've talked about. Uh, bull, bull, bull put spreads are a great uh, option spread strategy to use with the slingshot. Um, you can use that uh, to set up your, your bull put spread. All right. I have a quick zillion question from Stephen. He's just saying uh, sometimes the candles have are hollow, sometimes they're solid. Is there any differences in the two? Um, yeah. So the uh, what that is, I'll, I'll tell you real quick. Um, so the because uh, we were looking at we were just looking at one that was a great example. Um, but basically, so the if it's hollow, like here's a hollow green candle, um, the price, uh, the open was lower than the close or the close was higher than the open, right? Um, and it closed higher from the previous day. Um, if it's solid, like it was today on Verizon, um, see how, let me zoom in. 
So the close from yesterday um, was 53.83. So it gapped up this morning and opened at 54. It closed lower from the open. So it closed at 53.59, but it was still, the stock still went up today, 0.13%. Um, so it closed higher than yesterday's previous close, but it closed lower than the open. So that's why it's solid. So uh, a lot, on a lot of charting platforms, that'll show up as a red candle. Um, on the Zillion platform, it shows as green because price actually closed up today, 0.13%, but it closed down from the open, if that makes sense. So, and you'll see that happen the other way. So if you see like a solid, here's one solid green candle, um, the price, uh, uh, you know, opened. So here was the close, the close from the day before was 5016. The open on the next day was 5033. Um, and it closed at 5019. So it closed lower, but uh, on the day from where it opened, but it closed higher than the close from the previous day. So that's why it's solid. So if you see um, a green candle that opens high, it opens higher. Um, then the previous day and closes higher, it's going to be empty. So it's just kind of another way of visualizing it. Cool. So I got. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Um, again, if you're going to, if any of you are going to be down in Vegas uh, this week, it'd be great to see you. Stop by our booth for booth 405. Um, I'll also be giving a few talks. Um, I have a talk on Thursday and on Friday. And then I'm actually in the um, expert options panel. Uh, with uh, some folks from Trade Station Securities on Saturday. So I'll actually be giving a, a talk all three days of the event. Um, so if you guys are down there, it'd be great to meet you. Uh, hopefully you can join some of those or stop by our booth. And uh, otherwise, if we don't see you, uh, we will see you guys next uh, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. So hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining. Thanks for all the participation, great questions, and sharing uh, your symbols. So uh, we'll see you guys soon. Have a great week.